Oceanography. My name is Francis Poulain. I'm going to be chairing the session. Uh, if you're expecting David Straub, I'm sorry, I will, I will do my best to fill in his big shoes. I don't have the long hair, but I will try. Uh, so as usual, we will have 15 minutes for oral talks, 12 minutes for the presentation, more or less, and around three minutes for questions. Uh, if you wanted to ask your question at the end, you can either raise your hand raise the question, or raise the question in the chat, and I will do my best to get to you as quickly as I can. Okay, so it's my pleasure to present our first speaker for today, Bruce, uh, Bruce S S S Sutherland from Alberta. Thank you very much, Bruce, for joining us, and please begin whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you very much, Francis, and thanks everyone for showing up this morning. Uh, there's a fair amount of maths in this talk, so I'm going to be zipping through a bunch of stuff, hopefully just trying to get the essential point out. Uh, this work is an extension of work that was done by a Hui GFD fellow, Lois Baker, who looked at the interaction between a, ver a vertical mode one internal tide self-interacting to create a 2K superharmonic, which itself interacted with the parent. And it was discovered that the superharmonic uh, was nearly resonant with the parent. And so it would beat, it would grow and decay in amplitude periodically. This is an extension of this work to larger amplitude where the superharmonic can excite a 3K superharmonic, 4K superharmonic, and so on. Hence the superharmonic cascade in this title. So just as a brief bit of introduction, we're not looking close to where the waves are generated, where you have vertically propagating beams. If you're far enough away from the source, say in the far field in these observations in Hawaii, the dominant signal is a mode one, vertical mode one internal wave that propagates horizontally. These are long waves. They typically have wavelengths in the order between 100 and 200 kilometers. And being long waves, that will also feature into what I'm going to describe. So let's dive into the mass. What a great thing to do first thing in the morning. Uh, so the plan is we're going to take, we're going to work with a stream function and we're going to expand it uh, in terms of a parent wave that has some vertical structure. These are, this is importantly in non-uniform stratification. So it's a non-trivial uh, vertical structure function uh, and it will have a phase which is given by Kx minus omega t. And again, the idea is that it self interacts to create a super uh, 2K super harmonic it will also create an Eulerian induced flow effectively e to the zero i phi. Uh, and that's a separate study. Uh, it turns out that it's not important for this study because it's negligibly small, you don't have this resonance. So we, we do this expansion in the stream function as a sequence of superharmonics, each having uh, 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 wave numbers 2K, 3K, 4K, and corresponding frequencies, 2 omega, 3 omega, 4 omega, and so on. Continuing to break this down, uh, each of these vertical structure functions, of course, are just given from the, the linear uh, equations. Uh, so if you know the vertical structure, the, the background buoyancy frequency, uh, you can solve this eigenvalue problem, working out the vertical structure and the corresponding natural frequency of oscillation, we're calling omega sub n. Um, also in this expansion, I have this alpha parameter, that's the non-dimensional amplitude of the wave. We've non-dimensionalized things so that this is effectively the maximum vertical displacement relative to some characteristic uh, vertical depth of the stratification. Uh, throughout here, we're gonna assume that the stratification is an exponential profile with an E folding depth of D, typically on the order of a few hundred meters. And so this amplitude is gonna be the vertical displacement of the wave relative to that E folding depth D. It's gonna be an initial value problem where we start off with a parent wave where this amplitude A1 of T is one, all the superharmonics have zero amplitude, and we're gonna watch these things grow. This is a capital T, it represents a slow time scale, and effectively this will give us the beat period of the waves, and I'll define explicitly what this epsilon is shortly. So if you go back to the Boussinesque equations, everything here is done in a two-dimensional field with constant uh, depth. Uh, these are the Boussinesque equations on the F plane, uh, and you can take these equations, combine them to write them as a linear operator acting on the stream function being forced by nonlinear terms. And this is where you can see how you get the superharmonics. If the parent self interacts, you have an e to the i kx in one term times an e to the i kx in the other term. And that naturally forces an e to the two i kx. And that's how you get the superharmonic excited. And then of course the superharmonic can interact with the parent, create a three k superharmonic and so on. So you put in this expansion that we have, 
we can work out the polarization relations. Uh, and hence, we also know the expansion for the velocities u and w, also the spanwise velocity v, since it's a rotating system, the buoyancy and the vorticity, the spanwise component of vorticity. You put all that in there to explicitly get what is the forcing, and then you look at the response to that forcing. There's a lot of algebra between the last slide and this slide, but after you put all those terms in here, the linear operator can be simplified uh, to be what you see here on the left. And this is effectively what you have on the right. You can still see all those nonlinear terms. Uh, and effectively what you're doing is you're pulling out the interactions between an MK superharmonic and an LK superharmonic such that M plus N L is equal to N, hence driving an NK superharmonic. Uh, so this is a very general expression. Uh, and so again, a lot of stuff in here, but the key parameter here is this epsilon. It really comes out when you're deriving this expression at the top. Uh, it is the difference between the forcing frequency of the 2K superharmonic that's forced at a frequency of twice omega, but that 2K superharmonic has its own natural frequency of oscillation. If you tell me the wave number 2K, I put it into that linear operator, solve the eigenvalue problem, and I know what its frequency is. And these two are not necessarily the same, but if they're long waves, they're close. And that's what gives you this small parameter epsilon, which ultimately determines this beat period. Okay, so you put in all the polarization relations, you work out this monstrous expression uh, in the sum on the right-hand side, but it does all simplify down to what looks here like a relatively simple expression. You're still doing this sum over M plus L is equal to M, and all the information about the vertical structure and so on, and all the stuff in polarization relations is buried in this constant E sub ML. But in the end, what you have now is an evolution equation for the amplitude of the NK superharmonic. So if it's the parent that starts at one uh, and all the other for N greater than one, for N equal to two, three, four, uh, they start at zero, but this will tell you how it evolves as a consequence of this weakly nonlinear forcing. So what are these EMLs? Uh, again, I really hope you haven't had your breakfast yet because this can get really gross. If you look at the self interaction, say the parent interacting with itself, that would be an E11 term, it looks relatively nice. Crucially, it involves the Z derivative of the buoyancy frequency squared. And this is what tells you, you must have non-uniform stratification in order to excite superharmonics. You do not get this effect in uniform stratification, which is a warning to those who just decide, well, let's just simplify things and say it's uniformly stratified. You will throw away the essential physics if you do that. Now, if M is not equal to itself, the EML term looks like bleh, that, which is hideous. Um, however, if you assume these are long waves, that is to say that KH, the wave number times the depth of the fluid H is much, much smaller than one. In fact, most of these terms disappear and the dominant term again is given by this term that involves a Z derivative of N squared. But even if you don't make that approximation, this expression may be gross, but it can be evaluated and it just gives you a number. You know the vertical structure functions of each of these MK, LK and NK supermonics. You can do all these integrals and evaluate this and you get numbers. So it is gross, but once you do, do that numerical evaluation, you have a simple set of couple ordinary differential equations to solve. Okay, so let's look at a simple case. Let's just start off by looking at the self-interaction of the parent, the K superharmonic, to excite a 2K superharmonic. And that's just given by this expression here. And of course, again, E11 is just a constant. This is easily solved. And you get this as a solution which shows you that the amplitude, this A2, again, when T is zero, it starts at zero, but now you see that this gives you a beating frequency. This thing will oscillate with a period given by a frequency epsilon omega, so a small frequency, okay? Um, but also crucially, the amplitude of the thing grows to alpha over epsilon. And this is what tells you if, uh, if epsilon is really small, and I'll tell you near the equator, it's very small indeed, you can have a small amplitude tide, and yet you can grow these superharmonics to very large amplitude. And consequently, you can get this cascade where then the superharmonic is around long enough because it's a longer period, and it will then uh, end up cascading to create a 3K superharmonic and so on. So let me show this to you. This is the case I just showed you. 
The parent wave is at the top and the bottom, I filtered out the parent wave and you can see the 2K superharmonic being created. The graph on the right shows its increase and decrease beating frequency. So you can see it appear and now you can see it disappear only to reappear again because of this near resonant excitation. Okay, so that was the work done by Lois Baker uh, where we basically just focused on this first equation, but you can also look at the feedback. But now if this alpha epsilon is small, you can then get the 3K superharmonics and 4K and so on. So for what I'm gonna show you next, let's actually look at the data that was measured at the far field site in Hawaii. Give me a relatively small number of F, relative, you might think small amplitude, uh, vertical displacement amplitude, 15 plus or minus 10 meters. That when you non-dimensionalize in our units gives you all of these values that corresponds to an alpha of 0 0.075 and epsilon of 0 0.096, only moderately less than one. And this is what happens in this case. Again, you get superharmonics being excited, but that 2K superharmonic gets to large enough amplitude for long enough that it excites a 3K superharmonic. And in fact, higher superharmonics are being created, but I'm not plotting them on the, the, the right here. The consequence of this is that they conspire to form a solitary wave. And that of course will be a surprise to those of you who have been looking at shallow water theory. If you do this uh, at the equator, then the resonance is stronger. Epsilon is very small indeed. Alpha epsilon is 21. And once again, you get the growth of a 2K superharmonic cascading to 3K, 4K, and then you end up getting a solitary wave train. Now being aware of the time, let me just shoot through here. Hopefully you'll believe that. Because we get a solitary wave train, let's compare these results that comes from solving coupled ordinary differential equations to the results of shallow water theory. So this is uh, effectively plotting the vertical displacement uh, at a sequence of time. So a nice sinusoidal wave at t equals zero. And this is the evolution that we got from our equation uh, that maps very well onto the numerical simulations besides. We're gonna compare this with the quarter wave de Vries equation, including the effects of background rotation, that's the Ostrovsky equation, as well as an adaptation of the, the Miata Joik Massa model, which also includes that that was done by Helfrich and, and Grimshaw. And you can see that the agreement is excellent, especially with the KDV equation. These are the results when we're on the F plane, uh, close to Hawaii. If you go on the equator, again, both the KDV and the, super, uh, and the super harmonic cascade model give very good agreement showing the development of a solitary wave train. Uh, the, the, the other, the MCC model, uh, qualitatively it's okay, but quantitatively it's not quite so good. And so just to get to the end here, uh, I'm just gonna show you this movie. I've only talked about the superharmonic cascade, but we've also looked at the Lagrangian induced flow in particular, the Eulerian flow, as well as the Stokes drift uh, that's imposed. And here you need to consider horizontally modulated waves. And I'll just leave you this picture and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce, for, for, for the talk. So if you have questions, you can either raise your hand or ask a question in the chat. I will get things started. Uh, Bruce, you mentioned that in order to get these waves or these interactions, you need that the buoyancy frequency is not constant. Uh, what particular frequency did you consider in this study? Uh, so do you mean wave frequency or buoyancy frequency? Uh, buoyancy frequency, I, th I thought you said that it, that it can't be constant in order to get these interactions. And I was wondering what was the particular stratification you were considering? So in this, what I showed you, everything was exponential stratification. We've also done this by putting in a surface mix layer going down to 100 meters depth, which was observed. Um, and that makes no difference at all. And that's because the vertical structure function, which determines those coefficients, EML, are predominantly determined by what's happening, I'll say at depth, or, uh, well, around where the stratification is, is changing exponentially. Um, I could go into details on that, but that, that basically that doesn't matter. It does matter a bit if you don't let it be exponential all the way to the bottom, but more realistically, you let it decay less slowly uh, exponentially in the abyss, which is realistic. Um, but that just changes the nature of the coefficients. Qualitatively, everything I've talked about stays the same. Great, thank you. Are there questions for Bruce? You wanted to just jump in, you're also welcome to do that or ask a question in the chat as you prefer. It's a lot of math for the morning, I tell you. <laughs> it's not morning out in Newfoundland. So. 
I guess very early for some people, yourself included. Okay, well, if there aren't any questions, then thank you, Bruce, once again for, 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 for an excellent talk. Thank you very much, uh, Francis. So now we will transition to our next speaker this morning, Jonathan Tessier, who I know is from Waterloo because he is my master student. Uh, so Jonathan, whenever you want to start sharing your slides, please feel free. Hopefully you can see the slides okay and hear me okay as well. Yes, we can. Looks awesome. great. Okay. So hi everyone, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, today we'll take a look at a numerical study of laterally skewed jets inspired by the Gulf Stream. As a general outline, I'll try to answer the basic questions. Why do we want to study this? How we did it? What we expected to see? And what we found in the end? The first question is why? And from the endless literature on the Gulf Stream, you might already know that it's an important system in oceanography and in climate research. In fact, the Gulf Stream transports uh, warm, salty water to higher latitudes in the North Atlantic. And this has a warming effect on the, Euro on the European climate. There's also a significant interest to study the system from, bi from a biological aspect, where, for example, the induced vertical motions can be an important source of nutrients for oceanic plankton. But now to model the Gulf Stream, we need data, and we'll take the cross-stream velocity profile mentioned in Rosby et al. 2014. The observed velocity from that slice is plotted on the left as a function of depth and uh, the cross-stream coordinate, which we take as y. I then include on the right my best attempt at reproducing it using a very simple analytical expression. As some of you may notice, my approximation is a product of Bigley jets in the vertical and the horizontal, where we've added a skew parameter gamma such that we can arbitrarily skew the velocity in y with increasing depth. The form, as opposed to uh, taking raw data, allows us to study how a jet becomes a uh, or how a jet evolves for any gamma, and this is exactly what we plan to do. First, though, we need a complete set of initial conditions, including a buoyancy and a pressure, and we'll pick them to be a stationary solution to the incompressible and viscid equations. To generate these, split them both into two parts, one for the background stratifications and another part for the jet contributions, uh, determined by hydrostatic and geostrophic balance. The Gulf Stream has long been understood to be in, just, in geostrophic balance, as you might read in Stommel's book. And the aspect ratio of our jet is on the order of 10 to minus 2. So hydrostatic balance is also deemed reasonable here. I recall I said we'd like to simulate the evolution of a jet that's arbitrarily skewed. But more precisely, since our initial conditions are stationary solutions to the equations, I'd like to know how these jets become unstable for different gamma. And to do this, I'll be working with four different cases, starting with no skew at all in the top left and ending with our best approximate for the Gulf Stream in the bottom right. And the plots here give the velocity in filled contours along with the buoyancy contributions from the jet in white contour lines. Before diving into the nonlinear simulations, we'd like to know what to expect. And this is where linear stability theory comes in, allowing us to linearize the equations about a stationary solution, provided that the perturbations are small. The linear equations can be transformed into an eigenvalue problem, and the eigenvalue will determine how fast these perturbations grow exponentially in time. We tested three different models for the linear stability. The first, courtesy of Francis, solves the hydrostatic problem for a barotropic background jet, but allows the most to vary periodically in the vertical. Now, the figure on the left solved this solves this problem for different vertical and horizontal wave numbers and shows that the most unstable mode is one that is barotropic. So you see the, the bottom case here for the vertical wave number that is zero. And it actually fits approximately two periods in the horizontal domain. It might not surprise you that this is consistent with the second model that we considered, namely that of shallow water, where the uh, growth rates and spatial structures did agree very well. And though these codes don't allow for vertical variation in the background jet, uh, they do give us a reference as to how the barotropic equivalent of the jet becomes unstable. Of course, our nonlinear code can solve the barotropic jet, and we found good agreement there as well. Now back to the point, in studying surface trap jets, our third linear stability model, courtesy of Matt Harris, solves the hydrostatic problem but allows for vertical variation in the jet. And uh, this can evolve our jet for any gamma, and for the symmetric version, we found very good agreement uh, with the evolution. You can see the comparison here, where the left panel is the predicted most unstable mode in the theory, and the right panel is a result from the nonlinear simulation. We are plotting the perturbation vorticity and buoyancy from a bird's eye view in the top row, and then into the jet in the bottom row. 
One interesting feature is that though the vorticity looks identical to the barotropic mode we saw before, uh, there is some asymmetry in the buoyancy field near the surface. We also tried other values of skew uh, in hopes to see the same kind of agreement. And for the 0.5 case, uh, it did agree pretty well, as you can see here, for the same kind of case for the C for the same kinds of plots, apologies. Now, though the vorticity looks rather similar for this metric case from the previous slide, the spatial structure of the buoyancy did change drastically. The other two uh, more, more strongly skewed case uh, didn't quite agree with the linear theory, so we have a bit more investigation to do on this end. Regardless, let's move on to the nonlinear simulations. To start off, we'll compare the two cases we understand well with theory, so the symmetric and the weakly skewed case. The nonlinear solver uses the Oceanigans uh, Julia library that evolved the non hydrostatic equations on a GPU with a periodic domain in the x direction and then free slip and no flux everywhere else. We also added a small uh, white noise modulated perturbation by the velocity to kickstart the instability. Now for the for the symmetric case, let's see, vorticity grows to give uh, the structure you saw two slides ago. It'll eventually generate two rows of vortices and then three. And the top row kind of seems to be stationary or even uh, propagating in the opposite direction by the final time. When we increase the skew, you'll see something similar in the beginning, minus the uh, change in the buoyancy, then again, two rows of vortices, and the third rise again. Now for the higher cases of skew, we have gamma equals one on the left and our best attempt at reproducing the Gulf Stream on the right. In the gamma equals one case, vorticity has changed drastically where the shape in its shape and it's small and it's now of smaller scale. The buoyancy has similar features in the as the gamma equals a half case, but the jet quickly becomes unstable, leaving a couple of large vortices in the domain. The approximate Gulf Stream, uh, the mode is of smaller scale still. It looks very different from the modes you saw on the previous slides. And looking through the portraits of a color bar, you might notice that there is still uh, two, very, two very large vortices by the end of the simulation. So you've seen the movies, but it's difficult to compare the modes without taking snapshots or computing growth rates. And so this is what we include here. The right stack of plots show the snapshots of the simulations at a time of exponential growth with the corresponding growth rates in the left table. We also added the barotropic growth rate for comparison. As you can see, barotropic case is the most unstable compared to, to everything else, as you might expect. But the surface strap jets, uh, the first three data points suggest that, this, that the jet is stabilized for increasing gamma. However, the last and most skewed case is exactly otherwise. And this uh, suggests that the relationship between the skew and the stability of the jet is inherently nonlinear and requires further attention. To summarize the qualitative changes in the structure from zero, from gamma equals zero to a half, in the first row, vorticity changed very little, but the buoyancy didn't change drastically. Then from a half to one, both structures changed uh, and the instability moved to smaller scale, where we now have something like three periods in the domain in this corner here. And finally, for the last case, the instability moves to even smaller scales uh, with maybe five periods of the domain. Uh, of the mode in the domain. And the last two modes actually look uh, shallower as well. To tie it all together, let me clarify that the simulation I showed, the last simulation I showed, tried to describe the evolution of the Gulf Stream, and the other cases uh, could represent its evolution in different areas where the velocity might not be so skewed. Aggregating studies in the literature shows that picking different models or parameter regimes can effectively change the answer to the question, is a symmetric surface trap jet more unstable than the asymmetric one. And what we found here in the case of this answer also depends on how much skew we're talking about. For the parameters that we chose, we can't say that the growth rates increase or decrease with skew because our, our answer inherently depends on uh, the value of gamma. With only four data points, all we can say is that this relationship is nonlinear and we now require more sophisticated tools and more data points to extrapolate this behavior. Of course, much more to come and I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan, for the talk. Uh, that uh, you've certainly finished with time to spare, which leaves us time for questions. So again, if you wanted to ask a question in the chat or speak up, uh, Bruce, would you prefer to ask the question verbally? Sure, sure. Uh, I, I because there may be a follow-up. I, 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 you probably said it, but is this work on the beta plane? It's on an F plane. Sorry. Thank you. 
oh, okay, then I did not, it, there seemed to be a bias towards the vorticities forming, at least in your weak gamma cases of things being, I'll, I'll say northward going to positive Y. So I thought that might be a beta effect. Uh, do, do you know why there might be an asymmetry in, uh, in the Y direction? A very good question. Uh, I'm not too sure currently. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Other well, I was sorry. No, please go, please go. Uh, Jonathan, you I, I know you probably said it. Whoa, what's the stratification? Uh, let me see. Maybe I can go back there. So we have a background stratification uh, as I mentioned here, and then I have one like a, a part, a component for the jet, which is determined with uh, hydrostatic balance. Okay, but I mean, what kind of profile? Just just roughly, are you taking like are you taking so this plus the the const the constant stratification, if you will, like the the white lines. So I guess there there is already an asymmetry. N squared is not constant. I guess based on Bruce's talk, I was just wondering, right? Is n squared constant or not constant? Yes, sorry, n squared is constant. Okay, so that's so. I mean, I mean, Andy Bush's old stuff, right? They didn't they try to do something that that was like a stratification in in the actual Atlantic. I'm trying to uh, remember. Perhaps. Okay. I, I basically took a, a, a couple of, of lines or ideas from the, the Rossby paper and I tried to, to make the simulations look as realistic as possible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Other questions for Jonathan? Since we have a bit of time, going back to Bruce's question about the asymmetry. Uh, so beta plane can certainly cause an asymmetry, but the asymmetry of the jet also makes things quite different on the, say, northern side versus the southern side. So I think that's why we have different structures in the unstable modes. Thank you, Francis. OK, my pleasure. OK, any last questions for Jonathan? If not, thank you very much, Jonathan. And I will add that this is something Jonathan did as part of a project in the course, isn't even part of his thesis. So uh, I'm quite impressed, but I'm biased. <laughs> OK, so uh, we still have a few more minutes before the next speaker, which is me. Uh, and in order to try to keep time, maybe I'll just wait a little bit longer. But I'd like to say welcome and uh, hello and bonjour to everyone who has joined us at the session. In case you joined us a little bit late, uh, David Straw won't be able to chair the session today, which is why I'm taking the lead. Uh, nice to see everyone here joining us at the session. So I will start to share my screen. Uh, make sure I share the right screen, that would be nice. Okay, and if I share this. Can people see my talk? All good, Francis. They, they can't see it. You can't see it, good. Okay, I, I can't see Zoom anymore, so I'm a little bit lost, but uh, hopefully this will work fine. And maybe I'll get started now. I'm gonna try to keep tabs on my time so that I don't take up too much of your time. But if I end up going too long, uh, please say something and I will stop. But here we go. So uh, hello, everyone. This is work that I've done with a friend of mine, Nicholas Kevlihan from McMaster. And it's looking at the dynamics of a two layer shallow water, shallow water ocean model. So as usual, there'll be some motivation as to why we care about this. And hopefully I will convey that message to you effectively and some of the questions that we have hoped to answer. Uh, this is work that we submitted to the Journal of Physical Oceanography. It has been accepted with minor revisions. Uh, we expect to have it polished off in the next couple of weeks. So if you are interested in a preprint, please contact me and I'm happy to share something with you when we have a finished product. But we'll, I'll present to you the basic model and some of the methods without too many equations. Then I will share some visual results of the diagnostics, in particular, the vorticity field, not just because they're pretty, but I think they are. 
but it does help to illustrate some of the features going on, uh, which is interesting. But then in order to understand the global behavior, we'll look at some energy spectra, which is a little bit confusing at times, but I will hopefully guide you through it as best I can. And then if time permits, I will conclude. So ocean turbulence is a big problem that we're trying to understand. In general, just to take a step back, we all know that the oceans are driven by the winds and solar heating at large scales. Be due to a variety of physical mechanisms, the energy cascades down from the planetary scales down to the micro scales where they're, they are eventually dissipated. Understanding the cascade is a challenging problem which we all have to face and gives us a lot of work to do. Understanding turbulence is certainly something that arises in the oceans. Understanding turbulence has typically start off, started off in very idealized settings, which is a great idea. And a lot of the turbulence we understand is still in an idealized setting. And part of the motivation is to try to push things into a more complicated regime to better describe the turbulence that we observe in the ocean. And in the classical studies, as I'm sure everyone here knows, Three-dimensional turbulence gives rise to a direct cascade of energy, which moves energy to smaller scales. And the energy spectra tends to be on the order of, say, minus five-thirds. Whereas two-dimensional turbulence, which many would say is not really turbulence because it's doing the exact opposite, there's an in indirect energy cascade to larger scales. And there, the slope tends to be, say, minus three or so. The ocean isn't, isn't exactly one of these. It is three-dimensional, of course. But the rotation and the stratification govern the dynamics a lot to make things quasi two-dimensional, which is why we observe both sorts of spectra. I'm not going to be focusing on all aspects of the ocean, but we'll in particular be focusing on the larger scales that are generated by the wind, so wind-driven gyres in particular. And there are many models one can use. And general circulation models and three-dimensional models are, of course, very appropriate for describing the vertical structures, but they're also very expensive and very complicated. And I always like to do things as simple as possible to begin with and then add things on later on. On the opposite extreme, quasi-diastrophic turbulence has been studied a lot in the oceans, which has shed a lot of sight, a lot of insight on the problem. Unfortunately, if you want to study the globe, quasi-diastrophy breaks down in the tropics and the tropics is actually a significant portion of the globe. So that's not necessarily ideal. The one layer shallow water model can be used globally as people have used for tides, tides for a very long time, but it is essentially bare tropic and bare tropic dynamics certainly is not the ocean, but it's a starting point. In order to add one level of complexity, what we're gonna consider is a two layer shallow water model, which has the bare tropic mode and one bare clinic mode. And we're gonna consider an idealized consonant. So not the complexities that occurs with the real continents, but something much simpler. And in terms of the objectives of this talk and this research is to simulate global ocean dynamics uh, with all of these assumptions using one and two layer shallow water models. I'm gonna present the results from two different scenarios. And those of you that have studied wind-driven gyres, there are two classical theories that we usually come across. One is the stomal layer, which is where the dissipation arises from the bottom drag. And the other is the monk layer where the dissipation arises from the, the, from the lateral viscosity and the linear theory tends to be very similar but not quite the same and we're looking at these two different regimes we're going to see that the nonlinear dynamics can actually be quite different and we will consider different rotation rates just to be able to see what happens out of curiosity and in order to explore this we'll be looking at both vorticity plots and energy spectra so hopefully i have motivated it and got you very excited about the topic and now I'm going to share some, uh, share the model equations and the methods. So the starting point are the nonlinear shallow water equations for two layers where index one denotes the top layer, index two denotes the bottom layer. If you've seen these equations before, there's nothing terribly new, but I will point out that there is, uh, well, there is a wind stress term acting on the top layer. There is a bottom drag term acting on the bottom layer. There is internal drag, which, mix it, which, which transfers momentum between the two layers, and there's lateral viscosity. And the other two, so the first two equations denote how the momentum or the velocity evolves. Next two equation is due to conservation of mass. And I'm not going to talk about the details of how these are solved. If you're interested, I'm happy, I have a slide for that later on. 
But in terms of the non-dimensional parameters or even the, the dimensional parameters, there's a lot that arise here. The three dominant length scales, I think, are first of all, the Stommel layer, which approximates the width of the boundary layer due to the bottom drag. The Monk layer, which approximates the width of the Western boundary currents due to the lateral viscosity. And then there is an internal radius deformation, which is set by the stratification between the two layers. We've also defined a sub mesoscale thickness, which hasn't led as much insight as we thought, so we'll probably skip over that. And of course, there's a Rossby number denoting by denoting how fast the rotation is, and a food number, which I won't mention afterwards. So the physical parameters we're going to choose, and some of these choices might not be what you would choose, but it's they're a choice. In order to try to resolve things a little bit better, given the resolution we have, we're going to make an Earth that's a sixth of the time smaller as real Earth. We're going to flatten at the bottom so there's no topography. It's interesting, but more complicated. The top layer will choose to be mean depth of one kilometer, bottom layer mean depth of three kilometers. The first case, which is the, bound, which is the monk layer case, has a monk layer thickness of around six kilometers and a storm layer thickness really tiny, two meters. The storm layer case has a boundary layer thickness of around seven kilometers, so a little bit bigger, but not much bigger and a monk layer thickness of 200 meters. And the two different rotation rates that I'll share with you is the actual earth rotation and uh, the earth rotation a bit slower, so reduced by a factor of six. The reduced gravity is around 0 0.04, which is comparable to what people observed in some parts of the ocean. And the particular numerical tools we're gonna use to simulate this is wave trist, which is something that Nicholas and collaborators have been working on for years. It's a wavelet-based method, which I can talk about a little bit later on if you want. And to determine the spectra using spherical harmonics, we're going to use something called SH tools. Okay, so now to get on to the pretty pictures, at least I think what are pretty pictures. And this is the result of the simulation after 450 days, and it's spun up from rest. On the left, I'm showing you the bare tropic vorticity, so it's really the mean vorticity over the two layers. And on the right, the bare clinic layer of the top, bare clinic vorticity of the top layer. And notice that we do see that with this continent here, which is just a slab, if this ocean is, say, the Atlantic, we do see the equivalent of the Gulf Stream generated in the subtropical north. We have an equivalent of the Brazilian current in the Southern Ocean. We have an instability in the tropics, which is also, well, so we end up getting these three different uh, regions that each generate mesoscale eddies, which radiate off into the into the ocean and aren't really faced with a boundary, so travel for quite a bit of a distance. And notice that the baroclinic vorticity tends to be weaker and the length scales tend to be smaller, which is not surprising since the baroclinic, uh, since the internal radius of deformation is smaller. If we now, and I should say this was with weaker rotation, if we use the actual rotation of the Earth, notice we see something that is perhaps more similar to what we see in the Gulf Stream. We see that it doesn't extend quite as far. I would say it's a little bit more turbulent, and we certainly get a lot of interesting vortical features that develop, and the Vericlinic layer is comparable to before, a little bit weaker, but certainly very present and important in what goes on uh, in the oceans. Uh, the third case that I'm going to show you, the first two cases were for, for the monk layer, this is now for the stoma layer where the bottom drag dominates. Uh, now for the normal rotation rate, even though the layer thickness is about the same, the dynamics is clearly very similar. We see a lot of vortices being generated towards the north of the continent, even towards the south. We don't see the vortices being ra radiated towards the tropics. So the dynamics is clearly very, very different. And the bare clinic layer is actually much stronger in this case than the bare tropic layer by almost a factor of 10 which maybe isn't very surprising because of the fact that the bottom drag does tend to make things more bare clinic. So those have give, given us some particular scenarios to look at, just snapshots. In order to try to better understand the global features, we've also plotted the uh, energy spectra. And first for the monk case, which is the first case that I mentioned, on the left-hand figure is what happens with only a one layer shallow water model we end up getting a slope close to minus three, which is very consistent with the inverse energy cascade people have observed in many, many other problems. 
The second figure is the barotropic mode in the two-layer problem. And notice it's very, very similar, which isn't surprising because we know that the, the, the one-layer problem does describe the barotropic dynamics fairly well. But we also see that there is a bare clinic mode, which I will emphasize does have a much weaker structure, but it has a slope closer to minus five thirds, not to say it's exact, but closer. And this is consistent with an inverse energy, sorry, with a direct energy cascade to smaller scales, which is qualitatively different from what we see in the Bertropic dynamics. When we consider the Stommel case, where the bottom drag was much stronger, and the bare clinic field was much stronger as well, we see both the bare tropic and the bare, bare clinic fields do have slopes closer to minus three, and there isn't really a qualitative difference between the two. So uh, that's as much as I, I just want to give you a brief list of the conclusion. So what we found is we've chosen a rather idealized way to study the world's oceans using a two-layer model and found that even though linear theory shows that the monk and small problems behave very similarly in terms of the kind of gyros you develop, the spectra we've observed is quite different and it seems to suggest that the bare clinic motion is actually doing something quite different in the case of the monk layer compared to the stalma layer, which maybe isn't surprising because the stalma layer has bottom drag, which does dissipate all scales evenly whereas the monk layer does dissipate the smaller scales preferentially, and that's presumably what allows for the direct cascade of energy. Uh, and that's where I'll stop now. Thank you very much for your time. And I can't actually see anything. So are there any questions? If you have questions, please ask because I can't see the chat. It, may I ask a question, Francis? Please do, Bruce. I put it in the chat. When you showed your very first movie of vorticity, which was the weak rotation monk case, I, I thought it was yes. very, yeah, it just uh, the snapshot. I thought it was. I thought it was very curious. Whereas in the barotropic case, effectively you have single signed vortices, either positive or negative. But directly underneath, it looks like the vorticity field is dipolar. I'm just wondering yes. if you can explain that. Yes, so if you consider uh, Monk's theory about wind-driven gyres, which I, 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 had, I, I, did, I did have to dig up recently because I admit I hadn't read it before, you can predict the number of gyres that will generate, to be generated based on the winds and the continents. And in this case, because of the asymmetry, we actually end up getting two gyres in the south and three gyres to the north. And it's because of the fact that these currents are basically in between two gyres is that you end up getting the two different parities being generated. Uh, I'm not sure that explains the difference between the, the say, say if you look at the negative signed vorticity in the barotropic case, the sort of biggest vortex near the top on mm -hmm. your left-hand picture. Yes. Directly underneath it, I see two signs of vorticity, both negative and positive. Mm -hmm. is, is that explained by Monk's theory? I don't think so. No, no, I guess sorry, my mentioning of Monk's theory was just to explain why we have the bands of vorticity of different signs along yeah. the continents. And yeah. I just thought that those are what are basically being becoming unstable and then radiating vortices into the interior of the ocean. But maybe that doesn't quite capture what you were asking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't appear yeah. in the other simulations you showed, just this one. I just thought it was, it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, Francis, I do have a question. Okay. Yeah, hi. Yes. Yeah, so um, in your uh, shallow water equation model, and uh, the horizontal mixing is a uh, coefficient is a constant, right? It's not depending on the scale of the 80s. And uh, you will go back to your movement equation and your yes. mu outside of the Laplace operator. I was actually wondering if you allow the mu to be a uh, scale selective. Right now, I wonder whether that could affect the energy cascade. That's a very good question. Uh, we haven't looked at that. We certainly could. And I think you're right that if we do have either the, uh, the viscosity or even the bottom drag being scale selective, that would certainly have an influence on the spectra that arise. Yeah. I would be curious to know what happens, but I haven't yeah. considered that. But thank you for the question. Yeah, another question is, uh, so you use a linear bottom fraction on uh, RB. I wonder whether the long linear term could also generate some additional uh, phenomena. So that's two questions. Yeah. 
Uh, good question. Uh, I don't have an answer for it, so I, I don't know. And yeah. because I've taken up too much time, I should probably stop, but I am happy sure. to discuss it later on if you like. Sure, sure. Okay. Okay, so thank you all for listening to my talk. Uh, let me quickly transition from speaker to host again. Uh, and I think we're actually on time. So uh, we have a presentation by Theo Leclerc. If you wanted to share your screen, please begin whenever you like. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Theo Leclerc at my uh, And today I will share of my research, which is entitled Observations of Pupillings and Downwelling on the Head of the Gaspic. So, to begin with the Gaspic current, uh, the Gaspic current is the most remarkable uh, current in. Uh, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, it has a velocity that can reach about one meter per second in summer. Uh, it has a salinity, salinity front that generates uh, the estuary water mass from the Gulf uh, water mass. And uh, it's a current that can meander. The opening on the edge of the gaspic current is an odd research. The first to make this research is uh, Tong. Uh, Tong created a theory model where he explained that uh, the uh, density, the horizontal density agent, create vertical shear under the front, and that will promote a permanent downwelling under the gaspic current front. And uh, offshore the front, have a permanent pupilling. It's a uh, of them. Uh, however, this model does not the effect of wind or the deformation of the gas current front by bender. So uh, the problematic of this research was uh, what other mechanics may cause pupilling and downwelling near the gas. So we begin with uh, matter. Uh, Thomas analysis. Uh, we use CTD cast and ADCP data from four missions and CTD within data from the fourth mission. Uh, uh, CTD within data profile is a profile uh, that made uh, uh, in the, inside the water. Uh, we estimate the percentage of different water masses mixed together with conserved proprietors measure like temperature and need or mass. And uh, as a result, we have, uh, uh, we can observe a uh, new of the intermediate water mass, which is the cold burst uh, water mass is IRA, uh, that reach, reach uh, that cross the gas pay front and uh, down running under the, in terms of, uh, Quantitatively, uh, the crews that have the highest number of pupilling is the crews uh, for uh, with a number of 12 pupilling for uh, 14 seconds. And the last part of uh, my, uh, my research was as vertical motion. So uh, we use the interpolation as uh, an additive data from the mission. Uh, we test ontogenic and front disease, uh, which is re related to uh, the deformation of by earth and nonlinear and uh, transport, which is uh, related uh, is uh, the only equation and um, frontogenesis or frontolysis, uh, we uh, equal uh, zero everywhere. Test uh, the 
non nonlinear transformation. Uh, we use a uh, uh, surface boundary equal uh, the divergence of and, and with this uh, we have very good results uh, to show you some transect um, here we can see that uh, with uh, the uh, here it's uh, the uh, vertical motion calculated by omega without uh, the Ekman linear transfer uh, under it's with the, the Ekman linear transfer. And uh, we can see, for example, for transect four of this one, that we have a downwelling under the front and a new pulling that will uh, cross the front uh, of the, uh, it's, uh, the intermediate water mass, it's the coldest uh, water mass spiral. And uh, for the six have other question. Uh, uh, this time, uh, and uh, the uh, a new pulling. Uh, so we have two configuration. Uh, one uh, from. Uh, and the other uh, with uh, the downwelling uh, under the front. And, uh, and for transect line, another example, uh, it's more complex here because we have two fronts uh, the gas peak run front and one. And uh, in this time, Uh, and uh, check the, um, the vertical motion with uh, the nonlinear equipment transfer. Uh, we can see that uh, for shallow waters, uh, we have a uh, surface trapping. Um, so, uh, it means affect shallow waters, but uh, uh, not at the depths of. The intermediate uh, water mass. Uh, 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 the genesis and frontal uh, So, to discuss uh, my research, uh, we don't uh, see the prediction of tongues with uh, permanent downwelling under the front and an opening uh, offshore the front. Tug model uh, prediction does not operation, uh, and uh, uh, we have sporadic and downwelling, not a permanent. Uh, and the hypothesis that match most is a uh, frontal case or frontal genesis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for presenting your poster. Uh, we have time for a question. If someone has a question to ask, Theo. I guess one question I would ask is, given the data you've collected, have you been, would you be able to determine the spatial structure of the front or did, did you not measure it that in, in, the, uh, in that much detail? To calculate the, uh, the front, to have a uh, localization of the front, we use the maximum uh, horizontal density uh, gradient of density, the maximum va value of, uh, of horizontal density. Uh. Okay, so you were able to measure the yes. location of the front and the structure pretty well. Yes. And uh, we also check if we have the maximum value of a current with a uh, DC at. Okay. Well, thank you very much for presenting your poster. Uh, our next speaker is Clark. Is Clark uh, R R Richards? Clark, did you want to share your slides with us, please?
Are you seeing that okay? I see black at the moment. I don't see the slides. Could you maybe stop sharing and reshare in case that fixes it? Yeah, yeah. I'll just share the whole screen. <clears throat> That get it? Uh, do other people see it? I still see a black screen. Uh, sure well, I, I, I can I can see the PowerPoint. Yeah, I think yeah, it's I all right. It. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. slideshow we can see it. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so it's just me then. Then please uh, begin. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Francis. Uh, you know, thanks for hosting this session. <clears throat> um, my name is Clark Richards. I'm a research scientist at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography uh, with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. <clears throat> and uh, what I wanted to present today is some, some actually very recent work that I've been doing with my colleague, Matthew Dever, uh, who is at RBR, uh, which is a sensor manufacturer based out of Ottawa, and uh, our colleague, Breck Owens, who is a, an emeritus scientist at, at uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. The, um, Title of my talk here is Dynamic Response Characterization uh, for an RBR Argo 3 CTD. So this is um, really, it's actually kind of a specialized study. This isn't really uh, general oceanography. We're really uh, focusing here on um, response characteristics for CTD cells. And the, the context for this, um, which I'll talk about a bit, is these are cells that are being um, increasingly used on the Argo floats uh, as part of the, the global array um, for, for the, the global Argo program. So just a quick outline of the talk. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about Argo and specifically a little bit about the RBR CDDs on Argo. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of what I mean by dynamic corrections or, or dynamic response generally anyway. Uh, and then there's the, the sort of results of this talk. Um, some of them are, are um, wrapped up, wrapping up in a, a manuscript, which is actually in revision right now. Um, and others are, are sort of ongoing. These are part one and part two, which I'll talk about <clears throat> the tools that we're using to evaluate these sensor responses. And then uh, some conclusions and, and a little bit about the future work, which is ongoing. <clears throat> okay, so for those of you, probably everyone in here knows what the Argo program is, but if you don't, <clears throat> what it's a global array of profiling, drifting and profiling floats. Uh, these are autonomous floats, much like the one on the right here, which is a, a particular one made by a company called MRV. Um, <clears throat> they uh, drift in the ocean doing profiles approximately every 10 days, uh, usually the, this, the core array does profiles from 2,000 meters to the surface. Um, there are about 4,000 of them active right now, returning, returning profiles in near real time. <clears throat> uh, that data, of course, feeds uh, the global uh, telecommunication system, which is uh, the source of real-time data for all sort of you know, weather forecasting and, and operational oceanography and operational uh, modeling. Um, but the, the data is also archived and, and can be used for any other studies um, in, since the inception of the program um, a little more than 20 years ago. So this, this is actually a huge resource uh, in oceanography now. It's a, it's a, a giant data set, um, extremely beneficial to society, as we've seen with some, some recent studies, um, highlighting things like uh, heat content change in the upper ocean, and other things that are, are very much uh, important for global climate. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> currently the, the most of the CTDs in this array are of, of a type manufactured by Seabird Electronics or Seabird Scientific, uh, which is a pumped conductivity cell. Uh, in recent years, uh, RBR has been working with the Argo community to have their um, unpumped but inductive conductivity cell integrated into a variety of float platforms. Um, I won't get into all the details of this because I'd rather talk about the science we've done, but um, you know, this, as with anything, there's uh, advantages and disadvantages. Um, one of the big advantages is that with because it's an unpumped cell, actually the power requirements of the sensor itself are much lower. And, and in terms of Argo, this is a big benefit uh, because any power that we save uh, not having to run sensors, we can put directly into the lifetime of the float, which means, uh, you know, depending on the float platform, we may get um, something like 50% more profiles out of a float over its lifetime. 
uh, which is pretty significant. <clears throat> Uh, there's some previous work, which I, I won't talk about, uh, by Neslin et al., uh, which I was also involved with, looking at the stability of this conductivity sensor over uh, several years. And, and the conclusion is that it, it's quite stable. It looks really good. Uh, some other recent work has verified that as well. Um, <clears throat> but today, you know, what I wanted to talk about was what we call dynamic error. So these are errors <clears throat> that occur not because of static measurement uncertainties. You know, the, the, um, these, these sensors are all calibrated uh, very precisely in a, in a static environment where temperature and salinity and everything is very constant. But of course, the minute you put these things in the ocean where we have vertical temperature gradients and you move them through those gradients, then we can get errors and, and issues that relate to those changing temperature conditions. And there's a variety of different dynamic errors um, some of the common ones have to do with conductivity and temperature measurements because they're made from different sensors. If they're not actually aligned in space, then you can you can create artificial, uh, you know, or errors in salinity that result from <clears throat> from the mismatch of those two measurements. So points one and two here kind of relate to that. So one, they can be physically misaligned, but also because those two sensors have different uh, measurement principles, they, they can also have a response that isn't matched. I, I'm not going to talk about those too much either because there's a, you know, those are, are, are long understood problems, but the more interesting one and one that's really been a focus of a number of us for, for a few years now is, is this so-called thermal inertia uh, error, <clears throat> which results from the exchange of heat between the conductivity cell itself and the sampled water volume. And, and so you, you can appreciate that as a, an, an, an equilibrated cell that moves from one temperature um, patch of ocean into another temperature has to exchange that heat that it had before cool down or warm up. And in doing so, uh, can cause an error in the salinity that's inferred because conductivity is actually a function of both seawater salinity and water temperature. Now, the, this is a problem that's been known for a long time. It affects even the seabird cell. There was a canonical treatment for this that was done by Rolf Lewick and, and, and Rolf Lewick and James Piccolo in, in 1990 in a series of papers um, <clears throat> that, that talked about this. But basically, the idea is um, <clears throat> that when, <clears throat> when you have the sensor profiling through uh, vertical gradients of temperature, you can induce uh, errors in the salinity uh, as the as the sensor adjusts, and and this is just an example here um, from some data collected on from a float in, in the Caribbean, going through some very well defined, very uh, well mixed uh, double diffusive staircases, and so you can see the the left plot there is temperature. I don't seem to have a mouse showing up here. Uh, not sure why, but anyway, um, <clears throat> the left plot is temperature. The middle plot is is the salinity, uh, where I've high in the the right plot is the density, and and uh, what I've highlighted here with the circles is you can see that immediately after passing from one well mixed region into another, that there's a, a salinity and a, and therefore density error that decays away as the float equilibrates in the new temperature. And <clears throat> typically, the way this has been this has been handled, uh, at least for the seabird cell, is with a, a recursive correction. So it's like an exponential filter. Uh, where there's a couple of parameters uh, that, that depend on the properties of the cell that need to be determined. And these are these coefficients A and B, which in turn uh, depend on a, a couple of coefficients, which I'll, I'll highlight a bit more, alpha and tau. Uh, tau is a, a classic uh, time scale response, you know, an E folding time for that, that heat exchange. And alpha has to do with the, the sort of magnitude of the initial, um, the, the initial error due to that heat exchange. Now, you can appreciate that this can be pretty tricky to, to evaluate in situ because, you know, in the real ocean, you, you almost never really know what value you were supposed to measure. So you have to make a lot of assumptions. So to get around this, uh, what, what Matt and I did uh, actually is took advantage of a facility that exists at Dalhousie University called the Aquatron, where there's a recirculating flume. So we, we use this flume and it has water that, that circulates through it. Uh, we'd equilibrate a CTD in an ice bath flume, allow the sensor to equilibrate, which usually takes a, about 20 minutes. And then after recovering it from the flume, we could look at the data uh, and, and, and do an analysis on that. And basically what we're doing there is we're calculating a temperature anomaly based on the, the final equilibrated salinity value and, and conductivity. So we can come up with 
uh, you know, in measurement of, of what the anomalous temperature was that produces the error that we see while the cell is equilibrating to that uh, very, in this case, large, uh, but rapid temperature change. <clears throat> and then what we could do with this flume was repeat this experiment for a range of flow speeds, right? So, so Argo floats typically profile at around 10 centimeters per second or so, but, uh, you know, depending on the platform and the conditions that can vary. And, and there's, the, you know, previous work has suggested that these kinds of responses should be uh, dependent on flow speed, especially for a cell like the RBR one, which is unpumped, right? It's gonna, it depends on the flushing of water as the float moves past it. So we did it for a range of speeds and we did it with 13 different units. And, and I say we, I think I was involved in three of those and then Matt spent something like 10 days uh, just swapping cells in and out of a, that flume tank to, to get up to, 109 plunges in total. So a really nice data set for, for actually evaluating this. Actually the best data set I've seen for any kind of dynamic response characterization. <clears throat> so a little bit about the results. Well, what's interesting, and, and this has been known for some time, although I think with the flume, we were really able to, to pin this down. One thing that we see actually with the RBR cell is that those thermal inertia errors uh, were observed to have two time scales. So the first one um, is, is what we call it a short time scale error um, where the, 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 um, the e-folding time is about eight seconds, which is pretty analogous to the, the error that was described by Lewick. But there's also a longer time scale error, which you know, has an e-folding time, if you think of it that way, it's something more like 100 seconds. But what was interesting is that we found that that's actually proportional to the difference, the temperature difference between the water and the inside of the conductivity cell. And it happens that we have a, a thermistor inside the cell, which we can use to evaluate that error. So but in, in fact, if we plot uh, that temperature anomaly, so the, the plot at the top there on the left, you can see the temperature anomaly, um, that's the error in temperature due to this thermal, thermal inertia issue, plotted against the difference difference in temperature between the inside and the outside of the cell. And you can see that after that initial adjustment where there's really no dependence, um, you know, sort of at the, the higher temperature differences, it actually settles out to a very linear relationship uh, between those, those two things. And so using that knowledge, <clears throat> we can construct a correction, uh, which is not time dependent. It's really just temperature dependent. Uh, and it's, it's a, 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 you know, a nice slope coefficient, which I call gamma. Sometimes this is referred to as CT coef, a, co, you know, a conductivity temperature coefficient, uh, multiplied by that difference. And uh, on the right plot there, you can see an example uh, of what that looks like, where the blue line is the uncorrected salinity uh, error, and the orange line is, is after applying that sort of long time scale error. So you can see that the error really lasts for a long time, but we can get rid of it pretty well with that correction. Uh, um, we did some uh, some cinema analysis here, looking at the full units, you know, the full range of units. Um, here, I'm just showing a, a bit of this where we can use the sort of spread in our estimates of that coefficient at a range of speeds uh, to to estimate both the functional relationship with speed, which looks like it has a, a you know a relationship of about one one over the flow speed, um, but there's some scatter and in fact some individual. Um, variance between units. So, so the different colored dots there represent the different units uh, based, based on serial number. And there seems to be a, a spread there which we can actually propagate through to, to come up with some uncertainty around that correction, uh, which I won't get into too much here. <clears throat> the short-term error we can evaluate similarly, uh, follow the procedure uh, that, that Rolf devised, uh, as well as uh, the, the same idea from another uh, later paper by Morrison et al. Um, you can see when we look at uh, on the left, that's the, the tau, which is the time scale, and on the right is alpha, which is the initial magnitude of the error. Uh, again, we get something that looks like a, a, a power law relationship, uh, which is good because that's consistent with, uh, with other studies of this in other kinds of cells. And there, there is quite a bit of scatter to it, but one, one point that I wanted to make here is it's clear that all three of these coefficients decrease with increasing fl flow speed. And so there's a conclusion here that well, faster speeds require smaller corrections, which means you know there may be significant benefit to trying to profile these floats at say 20 centimeters per second instead of 10 centimeters per second, because that reduces the uncorrected errors by as much as 50%. And uh, the formulas there just show the sort of parameterized <clears throat> versions of these fits. 
which can be applied to data uh, to, to make those corrections um, on the fly. So the second part of this that I wanted to talk about was some work that was really started by Breck um, is to look at a heat conduction model of this cell. And I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here because this is sort of more the, the future work and the ongoing stuff. But basically what we did is, is created a 1D model uh, of the exchange of heat between the, the surrounding fluid and the internal components of the cell. And we do that by just solving the, the, the radial heat conduction equation, which I've shown there. Um, using the sort of physical properties of that cell. And this box just kind of shows a cross section of the, the relevant part of the cell where we've got a bunch of different components. There's a ceramic tube in the middle, there's a brass holder, there's some ferrites, and there's some plastic which surrounds the whole thing. And we parameterize the, the heat flux and the bound, laminar boundary layer thicknesses here um, according to you know, basic boundary layer theory. Uh, but you'll note that the, the, the boundary layer thickness delta uh, has a Reynolds number dependence, which means um, we're, we basically are, are including the effect of increasing speed in there. Um, <clears throat> just to quickly show some results. So, um, uh, sorry, exactly. sorry, Clark, it's, it's been about 15 minutes. If you could okay. finish up soon, please. Thank yeah, you very sure, much. I'll finish up. Hey, yes, so just results. The, the, basically, the model seems to work really well. Yeah, and And in fact, time scales, a slow and the long one, uh, which means we can use that model to actually to uh, evaluate some of these other things we see, such as the unit to unit variability, which seems like one theory anyways, that it may be due to just slight variations in the, the component dimensions inside that cell. Um, if we apply that to real data, we see that we can, for one thing, reproduce the internal conductivity temperatures quite well. The plot on the right is that uh, double diffusive staircase where the orange and the red lines are that internal conductivity measurement. Uh, one is the measurement and one is coming from the model. And then otherwise we can use that model to, to, to describe what the temperature anomalies actually are at, at the surface of the cell and in that boundary layer. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just leave this up. Um, I'd say, you know, one of the things that's still interesting about this actually is because it's so dependent on flow speed, um, we, we, we're finding some interesting problems trying to determine the difference between flow speed and float rise rate. So if a float is rising in, in a background vertical velocity, then that of course changes things. Uh, but mostly, you know, this is this turned out to be quite successful. And the goal now is to really implement these corrections on board the floats themselves and, and then continue using this model for other types of CTDs and other sensors and and uh, and so forth so yeah okay. i guess i'm probably thank out of time you. for questions but thanks yes. <laughs> yes thank you clark for sharing that and um, i just wanted to point out that we are involved in this we are over time so we so we do need to stop but i'm also happy to that the last couple of presentations have involved data it's nice to have a collection of different approaches in setting physical oceanography so thank you again clark uh, so our next presenter is Sheng Mu Yang. If you want to share your slides, please, and, and begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, uh, Francis. Uh, I suppose you can see my screen now. Uh, wait a moment. Yes, looks great. Okay, I set my timer. <laughs> oh, but so can you make it a presentation mode? Oh, yeah. Uh, wait a moment. It's the responding. Gosh. Hmm. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you. I'm Sheng Mu Yang, currently a postdoc working with Professor Jin Yusheng at Dalhousie University. Today, my talk is numerical study of tidal amplification in the Silver Gully of the Scotian Shell. It's a work I've been working on with Professor Jin Yusheng and uh, Dr. Kiko Hashi. We also appreciate the support from organizations and the programs shown at the bottom. There are four parts in my talk. At first, I will give a brief introduction to the background. The model configuration and the validation will be presented in part two. And part three will show part of model results. Uh, at last, a brief summary will be given. This map shows the location of the galley, which is marked by the yellow line. Uh, Cebu Gali is the largest submarine canyon along the shipwreck and also is one of marine protected area and famous for the whales, seals, and their other species. The circulation over the gully is greatly influenced by tides, and M2 and K1 are two dominant 
had constituents. They contribute a lot to the vertical mixing and the transport of nutrients in the garden. So far, a lot of work has been done to get better knowledge of the physical dynamics in the garden. A field program was conducted in 2006 and 2007 by a green nun and the scientists from BIO. Um, the observation showed that the tidal currents are amplifi uh, amplified towards the bottom, which shown uh, in the figure on the right, you can see it's partially for key one. Oh, wait a moment, I will show you my pointer. It's partially for key one, we can see um, a strong tidal amplification towards the bottom. Um, due to the spe uh, specific shape of the uh, Cayenne, previous study showed that the tidal currents could be amplified uh, in the gully relative to the surrounding area. And the SWOT in 2011 demonstrates the tidal amplification uh, induced by the resonance based on uh, analytical modeling. Uh, because shape break is a hot spot for the generation of the internal tides. So it was also suggested that the tidal amplification uh, could be induced by internal tides. And uh, here in our study, we developed uh, a two level nest model based on rust. The figure on the left shows the model domain of the sub model I1 and I2. You can see that I1 model has quite a large domain with the resolution getting finer from south to the north. Um, over the Gulf of St. Lawrence, its resolution is about seven kilometers. The right box indicates the domain of I2, which is shown in the figure on the, on, on, the, on the right. It covers half of St. Lawrence, entire Scotian Shelf, and the, and the Sable Island is at uh, around the center of the uh, domain. Um, the resolution of F2 is about two kilometers. For the model set up in the vertical, there are 40 sigma layers. The atmospheric forcing is from ERE5 reanalysis. The initial and the boundary condition are from Glorus. And the TPX09 tidal solution are used for tidal boundary conditions, including 15 tidal constituents. Uh, in the model validation here, we just focus on the validation for the tides. This figure shows the comparison uh, of the co amplitude co-phase of M2 in submodel L1 between our model results uh, shown in the left and uh, the TPXO data on the right. We can see a very three uh, amphodromic point um, in the David Strait uh, at the center of the, uh, St. Lawrence and uh, near the eastern boundary. We can see M2 tides propagate counterclockwise around the amphodromic point and at the same time, we notice there is a large amplitude of M2 in Bay of Bundy and the Hudson Strait. Um, they, are, they, are, they are induced by the resonance. Um, at the same time, we compared uh, T1 in the submodel L1. Uh, except the comparison with the uh, TPL data, we also compared our model results with other uh, previous model results. They are quite uh, consistent. Uh, with, with each other, uh, which means our model results are reasonable. Uh, also, we compare our model results to the observations got, uh, got from um, tidal gauges. Here, I just show part of them. You can see the black lines are our model results and the red line uh, indicates the observations. Um, in the comparison, three measures are calculated, including correlation coefficient, root mean square error, and the gamma square value. Um, for the gamma square value, it's a critical meter to value the model performance. The, the smaller the value is, the better the model performs. So as you can see, in the most part of the comparison, the gamma square value are smaller than 0 0.2, which means our model performs um, quite well. Uh, here, we double check the co amplitude co phase of M2 and K1. M2 is on the left and K1 on the right in the sub model M2 because the uh, boundary condition of M2 is provided by L1. So you can see that they are, are quite consistent with that in L1. Um, due, to the, due to the improvement of the resolution, we believe that the tidal currents could be better represented in M2. And also we still pick the uh, location at the center of the gully, uh, where is the observation site. 
to do the comparison between uh, the observed um, tidal ellipse uh, with at the different depths um, and the our model results uh, on the right on the right. Uh, you can see the generally um, the general trend of the variation of the M2 and K1 along the depths are well represented in our model. Uh, especially, you can see, uh, even for the tidal amplification of K1 was also captured in the model. Um, but it should be notable that uh, for the amplitude of K1 is underestimated in our model compared to that of observations. Based on our model results, the horizontal distribution of tidal ellipse at different depths uh, was studied. Uh, here, um, we, I just show the tidal ellipse at uh, 100 meters shown in black lines and the 400 meters indicated by the red lines. The figure on the left shows the M2 and the, the K1 showing in the right. Um, as you can see, there is a weak tidal currents over the deep water ridge and uh, it gets stronger towards the gully. From for the M2, we can see the uh, dramatic variation in the tidal current direction and the strength. And the K1, we can see the significantly amplified at 400 meters compared to that of, uh, at 100 meters. So we also uh, conduct our model in different mode. Uh, the, uh, the animation on the left shows the horizontal currents at the depth of 400 meters uh, in the barotropic mode. We can see there are strong tidal currents in the gully compared to the surrounding area. Um, by the comparison, we can see that the tidal currents in the gully in the baroclinic mode are much stronger than that in the barotropic mode. Uh, furthermore, we compared the uh, model results of barotropic mode and baroclinic mode um, uh, or along at the different depths at the center of the gully. You can see the biotropic results are indicated by the black lines and the red is baroclinic results. Uh, you can see that for the biotropic results, the tidal currents are quite uniform from surface to the bottom, including for M2 and P1. But uh, in the baroclinic mode, we can see the large variation um, including the magnitude and the direction for the M2 and K1, especially for K1, we can see there is clear uh, tidal amplification towards the bottom. Um, the comparison between the barotropic and the baroclinic mode, uh, we can see that baroclinicity play an important role uh, in affecting the tidal currents and the tidal amplification in the gully. And here, we tracked the vertical distribution of simulated temperature on the transect along the gully. The location of the transect shown in the figure on the, right, on the left uh, in the white dashed line, um, and the time series of temperature profile uh, shown in the animation. We can see there are strong internal tides are generated by the tide topographic interaction, especially uh, at the height of the gully. At the same time, we modified the gully topography like this small uh, seamount. We just remove it to see its influence and uh, it shows that the small uh, features, uh, topography features, uh, also could impact the internal tides in the gully. And this figure shows you the time depth distribution of horizontal currents at the, at the gully center. We decomposed the currents into a long gully velocity and across uh, gully velocity. The top panel shows the uh, model results of the control run, which means all the uh, forcing are included in this model, uh, except the uh, semi diagonal frequency strong uh, currents induced uh, uh, at uh, at up to our, up up 200 meters. Uh, we still see the strong oscillation around 500 meters, uh, even for the cross gully velocity. Uh, due to the internal tide generated. And uh, the lower panel shows the model results. Without tide, we call it no tide run. We still see, except uh, uh, influenced by the atmospheric forcing, we can see the induced strong circulation in the upper panel, uh, upper layer, 
but we still see some uh, relatively strong oscillation around 500 meters. So here we did a wave alert package spectrum estimate for the currents at 500 meters to see the variation of the uh, spectrum. Uh, we can see that in the control run, the top panel shows the control run result. Um, we can see that in the uh, control run, uh, there are two mainly frequency movement. Uh, one, the energetic is the diano frequency followed by the semi-diano frequency. But we still see um, quite a weak signal of low frequency movement. But in the non tidal run, we can see that except the energetic low frequency moment, there is still some relatively strong diagonal frequency moment induced by even without the tides by the external forcing. So that means extern, uh, internal waves, maybe internal tides with diagonal frequency can be generated by the external uh, forcing. It could influence the tidal currents and the tidal amplification um, in the gully. And uh, this figure shows the time depth distribution of temperature and salinity at the gully center. We can still see the similar pattern. Uh, we can see the strong oscillation at a deep, at a deep region. Uh, even in the no tidal run, we can see the oscillation um, of the temperature. Um, by the comparison of the salinity in different model run, we can see the effect of the tides uh, on the vertical mixing. You can see the color when we consider the, uh, the color change. Uh, to the specification when we consider the, the, uh, the tides. Okay, uh, that's all the results. Uh, here is the brief summary. Uh, in our study, a uh, two-level uh, two nested model is used to study the tidal amplification in the civil gully. The, we can see that the tidal currents in the gully have large spatial variations in the horizontal and the vertical. Um, and the internal tides are the main factor for the Tidal amplification of Q1, and it could be uh, affected by the baroclinicity, uh, topography, external forcing, and uh, even stratification. Uh, and here are some field work we, uh, we are planning to do uh, for the next step, uh, including the effect of stratification in different seasons. Also, the tidal amplification under different weather stations, like extreme event. Um, we also see that there are some deficiency in the model on the amplitude of Q1. So we will do more work to improve our model performance. So that's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Uh, we have time for one question. And uh, Susan Allen posed a question in the chat. Susan, did you want to ask it or did you did you prefer th that I that I read it out? Um I could just mention that, um, Shimyu, I really enjoyed that talk. And um, one of my graduate students, Kate, did some work on the gully in a, in a lab tank. And um, I put the paper there. And uh, she showed that it was potentially resonance happening mm -hmm. in the submarine canyon. And everything you showed from your numerical model looks like you've got that resonance happening now, um, which is really exciting. Um, but I just thought you might want to uh, take a look at that paper. Okay, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you very much. I will refer to the to the paper you post on the chat. Thank you. Okay, and thanks, uh, Shangmu, for the talk. Uh, and we have our final presenter, uh, Mina Masood. Uh, Mina, would you like to share your your slides, please? Hi. Um, and if you can make it full screen, I think that's yeah, probably yeah, easier sure. for everyone to see. That's can you perfect. hear oh, me sure. and see the slide? Perfect. OK. Perfect. Yes, we can. So please start when you are ready. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Mina Masoud, and uh, I'm a postdoc at UBC. And I'm going to talk about an intermittent gravity current uh, in the deep water of the Strait of, Strait of Georgia. And this research has been supervised by Rich Palvich and funded by Metro Vancouver. So uh, what does the gravity current look like in the Strait of uh, Georgia? Uh, basically, 
as a result of upwelling on the west coast of the Vancouver Island, the dense water move into the Juan de Fuca Strait. So uh, as you can see in the schema schematic plot as well, uh, this uh, dense inflowing deep water in Juan de Fuca Strait in, enters the boundary pass and Harrow Strait area at depths of about 100 meter. In this area, the tide, the tide are uh, the tides are strong, and at times that the uh, tidal mixing is at minimum, uh, distance water uh, flows down over the southern slopes of the strait to its bottom uh, at depths just over 400, uh, 400 meter. Uh, as a result of this process, the gravity current uh, is formed and it can renew the uh, deep water below uh, 200 meter and change the water properties, including uh, density and current. So uh, we actually have used the central, uh, the data from the central node and autonomous node at depths of about 300 meter in the Strait of Georgia. And as you can see in the uh, time series of potential density in 2018, uh, we see uh, that the density increased between 0.1 to 0.45 in 11 occasions that I actually show them in uh, like, you know, drop red boxes over the renewal events. Uh, and these, um, that this increment in density lasts for several days. And these renewal events flow, uh, flow down to the deepest part of the estuary. Also, these gray bars that you can see in the time series is actually our prediction of the timing of the renewal events that I'm not going to talk about right now, but the before and after values of the renewal events show the ambient condition at that depth and the values within the renewal events uh, show the values within the dense gravity current that actually renew the bottom water in the Strait of Georgia. And the post even rise in values are the effect of deeper, deeper water being pushed upwards by the renewal. So the relationship between renewal events and turbidity and current are um, summarized in this plot. Uh, you can see that as a result of renewal events, uh, we can see the turbidity in the second plot uh, peaks or jumps uh, as high as uh, 5 NTU. And also in the C subplot, you can see associated with these renewal events, a significant increase in a long gazovast current uh, up to 30 centimeter per second. And in this D subplot, you can see that uh, the vertical extent of these renewal gravity currents, uh, which is actually between 15 to 30 meter in a long gazovast direction. Although there is no unique general pattern in crosses of West current, we can actually see that the, as a result of renewal events, uh, the downhill speed uh, is uh, less than 13 uh, centimeter per second. Additionally, we actually have used the field program in late August of 2018. And uh, there, uh, the Toyo cross sections uh, carried out alongside of the T1, which is close to the central node, and also T2 and T3 sections, uh, north parts of the central node. So uh, as an example, we show some of these uh, Toyo sections, and in all of them, we can see in the first row plot, we can see elevated bottom densities near the bottom all along the slope. 
And this dense bottom layer has a thickness of around 30 meter, uh, but the density varies along the slope. And we can see that the greatest bottom density occur between zero to three kilometer east side of the central node. Um, and another interesting thing was like um, in T2 and T3 uh, Toyo sections, uh, we still see the strong bottom densities, but the bottom density is a slightly weaker in T2, T3 compared to T1 Toyo sections, which actually might be because of the mixing of renewal event with the ambient water uh, while it propagates toward the north. And also, as you can see in the second row of pellets, the turbidity uh, is uh, high uh, near the bottom, is well correlated with the strong, strong bottom density. And yeah. And uh, so in this plot, uh, we can see in the first plot, if we extract the depth profile of density from uh, T1 to your section, uh, we can see that the, the density within the renewal pulse is increased uh, over, uh, near the bottom, but we cannot see a unique general pattern. It's the same for turbidity. Uh, the depth profile of turbidity in all of the um, transects, we can see the turbidity increase uh, towards the bottom. In the third top, uh, in the uh, third subplot, uh, we can see the mean gravity current that we actually average detided low frequency current over uh, renewal periods uh, at the autonomous node and at the central node. We also uh, develop a steady state analytical model with linear eddy viscosity and Coriolis forced by linear density gradient, and actually, uh, which is actually shown by uh, dashed black and gray lines. And as you can see, uh, the model is perfectly matched with the observation. Both observations and the model show the highest velocity of mean renewal current uh, is around 20 centimeter per second and happens at four to five meter of the bottom. Also, there is a, a small uphill flow of two centimeter per second uh, at depths of 25 to 35 meter. Another interesting feature is that uh, observation and models show that the current rotate clockwise with height and um, the current actually angled at 20 degree uh, downhill within the nose of the gravity current. So as a summary, uh, we saw that the renewals in the state of Georgia occur as intermittent dense overflows. And these overflows uh, is formed as uh, thin layers extending ac uh, across the right-hand uh, right side of the uh, broad V-shaped valley of the state of Georgia. And also we see that the uh, flows are mostly along Isobas and with, with only a slightly downhill uh, current velocity. And all of these things show that the Coriolis, Coriolis force is uh, important in the dynamic of the gravity current. Also, we saw that the renewal flows are um, highly turbid and the highest turbidity levels occur um, near the bottom. Uh, and uh, based on the cross tran uh, transect plots of bottom density, the downhill edge of a current occur between zero to three kilometer east of the central node. 
And lastly, uh, we saw that the current uh, rotate clockwise based on the observation and the model, and the main flow, which is along isobus, uh, is surrounded by two opposite cross isobus flows at top and at the bottom of the gravity current. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I, I want to just acknowledge the uh, Metro Vancouver for providing the fund and the Ocean Network Canada for providing the data and people who did the Toyo sections uh, and Richard Dewey for his advice and Katia uh, for uh, quality control of the data. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, we actually submitted this, um, the result of this paper to JPO and got submitted with minor revision and it's going to publish like very soon. So if you want the preprint or have any questions, you can contact me at this email. Thank you, Mina. Uh, so I'm happy to start asking the questions and we have time. Yeah. Uh, actually, maybe to be polite, I will go with Bruce first. So please go ahead, Bruce. Okay, thank you very much for your talk, Nina. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to ask one. You showed uh, you had predictions of the renewal time which yeah. preceded these uh, pulses. Can, can you just tell me what goes into that prediction? Yeah, uh, so as I mentioned uh, in the boundary pass and harrow straight, uh, when the tidal mixing is at uh, is at minimum. The dense water can move into the strait. So, uh, because uh, the the water should be dense enough to uh, move into the deep part of the strait. So, we actually use boundary pass and harrow strait as a, a mixing gate, uh, tidal mixing gate, and we have used the proxy uh, to uh, to do that prediction. So if um, I have a backup a slide here, maybe, um, okay, it doesn't show the, okay, I, I'm just uh, going to just explain it. Uh, no, I, th I think I understood. Uh, yeah, it's and basically then, predictions of highest high tide. Yeah, so we actually use the um, uh, tidal prediction from active path and then compare uh, compare that current with the uh, velocity, the threshold velocity of around 1.26. And then if the uh, water would be dense enough, so that would uh, move into the strain. So based on that, we actually uh, suggest that the start timing of the renewal would be at the gray bars that you can see. Very good. Thank you, Mina. No problem. Okay, so my question was, uh, you mentioned that maybe uh, the maybe rotation of the Earth might be important, the Coriolis force. Yes. Have you tried to estimate what the Rosby number is in the region that you're looking at? I'm not sure whether you said that or not. If, if you said it and I missed it, I'm sorry. Uh, the Rosby number, I, yeah, I... Um, you know, uh, no, actually, we didn't calculate the Rossby number. Uh, the thing is, like in the Toyo sections that you saw, um, we saw that uh, the gravity currents is mostly on the right side. And also here, as we saw that the uh, current rotated clockwise, uh, we just like consider that it's probably because of the uh, Coriolis force. And uh, as a result in the uh, analytical solution that we have developed, we actually include Cor Coriolis force and the model results is actually perfectly matched with the observation. And it's, it was just another confirmation on this uh, on this matter. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that's all we have time for in this talk and this session. So I want to thank everyone who has all the speakers at the session today, and also everyone who was able to attend and, and asking your questions. It's been great to see you all virtually. Uh, we do hope to continue organizing the session in the future. So hopefully next year, we'll maybe get to organize this in person. So as you probably know, there is a plenary session that started four minutes ago. 
So uh, that's going on. There's a poster session after that. There may be, I don't think there are any posters from the session. So I believe that concludes the talk, but or the session, but thank you everyone for participating and I'm wishing you all well on, on behalf of me and my co-organizers.